This is part one of my book. At the beginning of each section, I will tell you what we're going to be talking about. Um, and today, these are the things I'm discussing through the book. I talk about the loss of the partner, how you feel you've lost your centre, how you can be very unstable and what to do about it. I talk about how we use damage control to work our way through. The days you are forgetful, <laughs> your sleeping problems, your meltdowns, the fact that you cry all the time and then the one where you fall into the abyss. Each time I start a new section of the book, I will just be relaying what I have talked about in that section. Sometimes you're going to find I make a few little mistakes. I've left them in because it's actually been quite hard to read the book to you, considering it's just a short time for me. So I ask for your patience and understanding, and I assure you, you do have that. Enjoy the book. After my husband died, I decided to write a book on how I managed through the grief. I'm still doing the grief. I'm still working my way through lots of things. But I wanted to share what I'd found out to be useful. I wanted to share what concerned me. And I hope that some parts of this book will help you. There will be parts that don't probably resonate as well as other parts. But I hope within that you'll find some solace. My heart goes out to you. I know what you're going through. It's really difficult, but we can get through this and we can survive. So here we go. One of the greatest losses is of a partner or spouse. Your whole world revolves around the union you have formed and once they pass, your life changes forever. The loss is not only of them, but of your focus, your lifestyle and the way you relate to the world. When I lost my husband, nothing prepared me for the monumental upheaval it caused. Nothing, and I mean nothing, was ever the same. From dawn to dusk, the effects went straight through me. I was totally lost. Losing my partner and marriage was devastating. My future became uncertain and felt empty. The void was massive. When you face this sad reality, the journey through it is very difficult. I never realised how challenging and lonely the path was. The longer and deeper the connection, the more heartbreaking is the loss. When they are sick, you start to lose them before they pass, and then they die, and you grieve as they die. When they die suddenly, the shock must be overwhelming. You will find your way through it all, but not without the passage of love, time and support. Never think you are weak during the grieving process, because it is very difficult. Losing a partner is a depth of sorrow only those who have felt it understand. Losing your partner also means you lose the centre of your world. <clears throat> now there is no centre and no safe place to lay your heart on. This is the price one pays for the incredible beauty of love. Ray was the centre of my world. Although we were two individual units, as a couple he was my focus. This is how the specialness develops between people. However, with the loss, the centre no longer exists. You are left only with yourself and the memories. Losing your partner destabilizes every aspect of your daily life. In that moment, nothing is ever the same again. Losing your center feels overwhelming. Your rudder is gone and you're drifting aimlessly around. Piecing your life together takes months, years, and for some, decades. The journey is long and arduous. Months after his death, I continue to feel disoriented and weird. Everything changed while parts of me were stuck back there. I thought as a couple, felt as a couple, and even related as a couple. It takes ages to step out of being a couple. Switching your focus happens straight away when they die because you have no choice. However, the deeper healing requires time and patience. Some people never let go of the centre feeling and cannot move away from being a couple in their mind, regardless of the loss they are married as before. They live both in reality and fantasy. However, truly moving on is living in reality and allowing your new lifestyle to activate. Your loved one remains in your heart as you stride ahead alone. Being in a couple defines who you are, and in loss, that part of you dies as well. Afterwards, it's not a good idea to make any decisions. Emotions are raw and you're not yourself. The loss propels you into unknown territory. 
try to do what has to be done and leave challenging issues for later. Usually your family and friends see your wobbly antenna even when you think you are fine. Listen to those who love and have your best interests at heart. Many people give advice during this period. Beware of listening and acting upon it. Sometimes others have their own agenda or voice opinions through their own filter. For example, those who use travel or big nights of binging as release offer these as solutions. What is a solution for one person is a terrible idea for someone else. Your moods, moods may go up and down. When you lack sleep, everything is worse. On those days, lessen your stress by checking out of daily life. This retreat allows you to rebalance. On the continuous crying days, I did not venture out to the shops. I ignored the mobile and did not answer the door. There were weeks when I thought I was doing well, only to have my son say otherwise. I took notice of their counsel. Distress is easy for others to see and harder to accept in ourselves. At the beginning, I wobbled around unexpectedly and felt embarrassed in public places. Eventually, I stabilised somewhat, but it seemed to be hit and miss. Read the signs and ask a close family member or friend when another opinion is needed. Wanting to be fine is not the same as being fine. Damage control is trying to make the best of a situation and after the death, you will go into damage control. It manifests when you distract yourself, ring a friend, go to bed early or bury yourself in a book. In these situations, mitigating the damage helps to work through the pain. It is like time out for your heart and from your world and it provides a little relief. The same emotions are running underneath, but you ignore them. Temporarily, I found that it was a useful strategy. Loss creates massive emotional damage and damage control is a form of mindfulness. We go somewhere else. Everyone going through grief endeavors, endeavors to minimize the pain. <clears throat> when you're about to cry on the bus, you try to focus on another less sad thought. You minimize telling your family how terrible your week actually was or put on a brave face during a social outing. However, understand, although it is a useful technique, it is not fallible. Sometimes you manage to soldier through and lessen the tears, but not always. Damage control may work brilliantly and then fail dismally. Certain individuals often try to use it to stem your tide of grief because they don't or can't deal with you. They change the subject, make jokes and steer away from the obvious. I was usually aware of this tactic and often tried to hold my feelings back, but emotions have a habit of spilling out regardless. Not all of us are comfortable with public displays of grief. In these cases, we are shutting the person down for our own comfort. During my grieving time, I tried to shut down my emotions to make it easier for others, but it was stressful being in these social situations. I never knew when the tears would well up and take over. Once I began to cry, it was hard to stop it. Staying at home on the vulnerable days and not being with these people was simpler than holding back the tide. With more compassionate and kind people, I thought I could be all of myself and these connections were more freeing and safe. When my tears came, it was just a natural part of the visit and I felt less stressed. Damage control has its place. On happy occasions, you do not want to be the wet blanket sobbing in the corner and if you are able to contain your grief for a while, it is great. In situations when I was beginning to melt down, I simply excused myself and had a big cry. Like me, you might find that happy events actually trigger more sadness. sadness. Family events bring to the fore the fact that your partner is not there to share them this moment with all of you. It is a silent, deep sadness inside of your heart. Don't be surprised when you experience forgetfulness. After loss, you may lose the ability to remember people's names, use the wrong words, can't remember the word, and generally sound like an idiot. It happens to nearly all of us. It is as if a part of your mind is lost and cannot find itself again. I call people all the wrong names, got lost mid-sentence, and forgot what I was talking about. I had trouble remembering time and do, doing what I was supposed to do. I didn't buy the right things from the shop or would come home and bought something different. The stress of grief confounds your brain. There is a sense of being disconnected to people and situations. The strain overtakes reason. 
Perhaps the shock of the death and the terrible change in your life begins this process. Others noticed my disconnection and warned me to take care. I was discouraged from driving the car on my bad days and from making any major decisions. Listen when your family and friends bring your behaviour into question. My sons told me I looked somewhat startled and wired (laughs) and they alerted me to this and guided me through it when it happened. Remember that although disconnection is common, basically you are not yourself and do not appear present. Listen and do not let stubbornness and pride override the situation. The shock of grief manifests in many strange ways and this is one important one because you are not functioning in the normal range. Accidents and bad decisions result in not being aware of this disconnection. Slow down when it happens and recalculate as your GPS says. Although I felt frustrated and not everyone noticed my mistakes, I simply renamed the purse and began the sentence again and asked for the question to be repeated. Being on overdrive causes this temporary loss, but it's annoying. The mind is processing so much, it is like you can't focus as before. Do not think it is dementia or that you are losing your mind. It is simply a result of the pressure being placed on you. As you calm down and begin the healing process, these issues will pass and eventually you do have days of clarity and stop calling your son by the dog's name. Time is all it takes. Sleeping through loss and without your partner affects your sleep. This heightened state blocks you from going to sleep, staying asleep or waking up continuously. Being highly emotional or crying for hours also changes your capacity to get sleep. You miss another person being near you. It is lonely. The bed is enormous and empty. These nights have become part of my journey. Nothing I tried to do helped. Eventually I accepted it as I watched the sun come up. You may use sleeping tablets, but sometimes a sleepless night still happens. In the course of grief process, do not be surprised to experience these nights. Take heart that many of us all over the world are awake. Grief disturbs many of the natural rhythms of the the body. You are literally knocked out of kilt. It is advisable that you get up and do something different instead of lying there. However, I did not have the energy to do it. Loss is tiring. All I wanted to do was lie there and wait until fatigue finally won and I dozed off. Not having good sleep affects you negatively and your emotions are more likely to be compromised. After months of little sleep, I worked around my situation. Instead of trying to do everything, I slowed my pace. All physical work was minimised on those days and I kept away from stressful situations. Instead of facing negative or draining individuals, I rescheduled my time with them. Like eating, your sleep patterns are disrupted and instead of fighting it, you may choose to ride the wave. In time, it will improve and your body finds its own status. Until that day, be kind and nurturing to your mind and body. It's doing the best it can considering the gravity of change and the daily upheavals. I use the time awake in the dark to meditate, release unwanted emotions and process current issues. It's normal to have constant meltdowns as well. These episodes are spasmodic and you may have big and small meltdowns. Your grief simply spills into everything. When you are a private person, coming to terms and acceptance of this takes time. I broke down in coffee shops, in banks and at the slightest provocation. The floodgates opened and the tears flowed unrelentingly. The greater the loss, the more meltdowns you seem to suffer. The best outcome is to know that it is unavoidable and not a sign that you are losing it. Be kind to yourself. I expected the meltdowns to be easier after a few months, only to find them getting worse. I hoped before I set off for the party or shopping trip, those previous hours of tears would dry me up. However, it was not always something I could rely on. To me, it is surprising with the amount of heartache around that are not more people crying in public places. I know I was one. Time is a great healer, and although meltdowns are annoying, they are great because they release all your pent-up emotions and you'll find in time there will lessen in intensity and there seem to be bigger gaps between them. When Ray first died, I cried every day, (laughs) every single day. I cried for months and months, morning, noon and night. The tears were relentless. I gave up trying to hold them back and simply cried them out. There were loud sobbing tears and silent hot ones. Sometimes it took a few minutes and other days I cried for hours until my eyes burned and my face puffed up and I looked like a toad. 
There are people who never cry and that is another problem. Not being able to cry brings its own problems. A friend of mine wished she could cry but no tears came. She thought there was nowhere for her grief to express itself. The more we loved, the bigger the bucket of tears. You have two buckets. You lose the person and you lose the relationship. It is normal to cry in private and then unexpectedly in public. There's no pattern or warning, except the tears will flow and arrive whenever they want. Initially, I was embarrassed, crying in all these different places, and then my son explained that no one judged me. If anything, they felt compassion and were ready to offer comfort. Many times, people rushed to get me a tissue or try to calm me down. You will find in time, you empty those two buckets of tears. Tears are the physical manifestations of your love. There will be times when you also fall into the abyss without warning, when you seem to be doing okay, and then bang, it is abyss time. I liken this to a complete breakdown, because the emotions are nothing what you, that you have experienced before. When it first happened, I felt terrible. It was a sorrow and depth of despair like a massive dark pit. And once in the abyss, I felt unable to pull myself out. It was unlike a meltdown, it felt like a breakdown. After a couple of abyss experiences, I decided to let it all out and be there until it ended. The pain was unbearable and I cried and sobbed in a way I had never done before. My whole being ached and shook with the grief, despair and a sense of incredible loneliness swamped me. The abyss is a normal way that we can grieve. Do not be worried about it. However, if it becomes too much, you can always get help. You may try to move around the abyss, but letting it release is better. These emotions are genuine and inside of you. They are coming to the surface in an attempt to be processed. Feeling them and allowing yourself to be in this excruciating space is actually wiser. I found being alone was best. Then you are able to fully express your hurt and misery without being on show. Usually the abyss occurs when you are alone, at night or early in the morning. Letting the emotions emerge and move through is painful and feels like an ordeal. The crying is different. It is as if your soul is crying tears of unimaginable pain. Time is non-existent and you come out of it exhausted and empty. 